Okay, so um, we postponed the assignment, so it's due today instead of yesterday. And uh, the question was, is there a, um, this is a C minus minus project, right? So the question is, is there a, some code in a C minus minus project that, that um, you have to complete? And the answer is no. So I thought, but what's really neat about our new plugin, our new Java Baki plugin, is that if you go to the, what you should do is go to the, um, to NetBeans, select File New, File New Project, and when you select File New Project, if you have that Baki Beans plugin installed, it will give you a C minus minus option. So select the C minus minus option and give it the name, what's the name of the homework assignment that's due today? ALG dash, dash 6 dash 19. Just give the project that name without the .cm. And it will create a folder with that name and then inside that folder it will create a little a skeleton C minus minus program that has that name .cm. And that's what you'll fill in. That's what, what you will finish to get the, you know, to write your code. All right, so that should, that's another nice thing about having this plug-in. I tell you guys, last year, last year, I, <laughs> I don't know what took me so long to do this, but last year, every, we did our Java on the command line, and we did this C minus minus on the command line, and it was, this is a whole lot smoother. Uh, it's a whole lot better system. Now, so while we're talking about that, uh, let's take a look here at the slide. Um, we said this is the picture of the circular buffer, and we've done this before. You know, you did this in data structures. You did the circular buffer in the data structures. And then here's the code that you, is, it's, all, it's practically all done for you right here. Uh, the producer, consumer with the circular buffer. And um, so are there any questions about this before we go on? And I think there were some instructions in the um, assignment about how to have, of course, we don't want to loop forever. So what, what did I ask you to do on that assignment? To have one of them loop? Oh, no, I guess they have to both loop the same amount of time, right? Because you want... 15 times. Yeah, 15 times. Mm -hmm. And then some other little specifications there. All right, so are there any questions about that? How that works? Mm -hmm. All right. Good deal. Now, you guys... <laughs> yeah, this is a big drum roll. Okay. Do you remember when you were first learning how to do recursion many, many years ago? And it was back there in the first year, you're, the first year you took a programming class and you first learned how to do recursion. And there is one famous, famous problem that every textbook and practically every computer science professor uses to teach recursion. And that is... Oh, Fibonacci, that's a good one, but that's not the one I was thinking of. It's Towers of Hanoi. I mean, don't you guys remember doing Towers of Hanoi? Usually when you do it the first time, it's kind of a struggle because you have to figure out, you know, how Towers of Hanoi works. Well, Towers of Hanoi is a famous problem that everybody... But I t I'm going to tell you this. This next problem, the dining philosopher's problem, is, is to concurrency as the Towers of Hanoi is to recursion. This is the go-to example that is, um, that's, that's always used. And in fact, it has a rather illustrious history. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before, but do you know who invented semaphores? I should have, you should know this. This is part of our history. It's Edsker Dijkstra. Dijkstra, yeah. He invented semaphores. And not only did he invent semaphores, he presented this dining philosopher's problem as an example of how to use, of how semaphores can be used for concurrency. And this, this problem is so famous that there have actually, there have been, there are computer science journals that have had a pictures of philosophers sitting at this dining table eating spaghetti, you know? It's that famous. Every computer scientist knows the dining philosopher's problem. So this is like a, a classic. This is just a classic. So here we have a picture. Oh, we have some data structures left over here. Okay, so here we have um, a picture of the dining philosophers. And there's five of them, and they're at the circular table. 
So, you know, those are the little smileys, right? Or, you know, people. They are indifferent. <laughs> They're neutral. <laughs> they are philosophers. They have to maintain neutrality and only do pure reason anyway. <laughs> Don't let their emotions get in the way. <laughs> and what we have is we have these five philosophers sitting around this circular table and there's also a fork in between each philosopher. The scenario is they are being served spaghetti. Don't ask me why they use spaghetti, but they, it kind of doesn't make sense. But they use, they're, they're eating spaghetti, and it takes two forks in order to eat spaghetti. I guess because you have, to, you have to put the forks in like this and pick it up like this and shovel it in like that. I don't know why. Actually, I had, I've had students in the past say, oh, no, no, they shouldn't be forks. They should be chopsticks because you, need two cho you definitely need two chopsticks. Oh. So, you know, I, I thought that was a good, a good thing, but the tradition is forks, you know, so I don't know why. And, and in our book, you know, it's forks, you know, but anyway. So, and, and here's the problem. The problem is, now this is obviously a concurrency, it's the, this is obviously con concurrency, because what do philosophers do? They think. Yeah, they philosophize, right. <laughs> they philosophize, they think. But on the other hand, they also have to eat in order to live, right? So what do they do? Throughout, so what do they do? They alternately do what? Think, and then eat, and then think, and then eat, and then think, and eat, and so on, right? So they, they're thinking and eating, thinking and eating, thinking and eating. Okay? But now, and so, but now how can they eat? How can they eat? They have to pick up two forks. It takes two forks, right? So they pick up two forks, they eat a while, then after they get after they want to think some more, they put the forks down, and they go, hmm, and then they pick up the two forks, and they eat, and then they think, eat, and they, so each one of them is doing it, and they're, furthermore, they're doing it concurrently. Are you with me? Now, so the question is, how can we simulate the concurrent eating and thinking of these philosophers with our, with, and, and the solution that we're going to use to this problem is using semaphores, okay? So, Here's the activity of each philosopher. The philosopher picks up the forks, eats, puts down the forks, thinks, and each philosopher does this in a loop. Yeah? That's, that's the activity of each philosopher. All right? And so here is an algorithm 6.9 is an outline of the dining philosopher's scenario. And this is, this is for, um, now we just have P1, P2, P3, P4, but obviously there's a, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and R and S, and so on, all right? Actually, what we're going to do is we're going to have an array of philosophers. <laughs> so, okay, so, so, so what, so, and even though this says loop forever, I think, I forget, maybe, I forget what, what you'll do, I think maybe 10 or 15 times. And then, and so you have think, and then you have pre-protocol, and you eat, and you have post-protocol. Now, why is eat the in the critical section? Now tell me, why, why is eat in the critical section? Not everyone can eat at the same time. Why can't everyone eat at the same time? Because there's not enough for it. Scarcity of resources. Oh, we have some economists in the class here. <laughs> Scarcity of resources is right. There's not enough forks for everyone to be eating at the same time. So what do we have to be able to do? What do we have to do? We, have to, we want, if someone wants to eat, but the neighbor is doing what? is using the fork, eating, and therefore using the fork that that philosopher needs, then what does that philosopher have to be able to do? Wait. Wait. Sound familiar? Okay. Okay, so wait. All right, so now here is how we're going to implement this. Because the philosophers are doing their things concurrently, each philosopher is a process. Now let's think about that. So, and what, what, how we are going to track the philosopher's activity is in our run, you know, in the, in the code for the, for the process, we're going to have the, we're going to have, we're going to output some output statements and say, you know, I'm eating, this philosopher is eating, this philosopher is, you know, is uh, thinking, this philosopher is finished eating, whatever. And we're going to loop through those activities, but we're going to do them concurrently. So each philosopher is a process. On the other hand, each fork is a semaphore. All right? Now, and like I said before, 
instead of having P, P, Q, R, and S for their names, we are going to have an array of processes and an array of semaphores. But that's fine. You can have an array of anything. Are you with me? And so they will, and so, and, and uh, here is how our numbering scheme is going to work. Now I think there, as I recall, there might be a discrepancy, in, the, the book might be a little inconsistent about how it does its numbering. I, th I think there's a small, a slight error in the book. But this slide, go, go based on this slide. So what is it, so you see here is philosopher sub-zero. And so philosopher sub-zero has fork sub-zero on his left and fork sub-one on his right. Do you see how that works? And then philosopher one has fork sub one on his left and fork sub two on his right. And philosopher two has fork F2 on his left and fork F3 on his right. So philosopher I has fork I minus one on his left and, oh wait, I on his left, okay, I on his left and I plus one on his right. Are you with me? Except for who? Philosopher 4, who has I on his left and 0 on his right. But what does he have? Mod, mod 5. So we actually, so you could use mod for that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, is everybody clear on, on, how, that, on what, how that works? Okay, you guys. Now, do you remember how we had first attempt, second attempt? Okay, let's think about this. No, we philosophers. <laughs> let's think about this first attempt, okay? And here's the code for the first attempt. And this, is, this code is the same for every philosopher. So here's our first attempt. What we have is we have semaphore array. Now, do, you, do we understand how this works? Semaphore array, 0 dot dot 4 fork gets... One, 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 one. So now what does that mean? Well, yeah, but what, is the, what does this initialization mean? It means that fork sub zero has a S sub, has a fork sub zero dot V of one. Is everybody clear on that? So using our terminology, it would be, it would be, uh, for, it would, so fork is the name of the semaphore, right? But fork is an array, so it would be fork sub zero dot, and did we call it SV? Uh, gets one. Is everybody clear on that? Well, what's going to happen is the reason it's initialized to one is that whenever we do a Whenever we want, whenever we want to pick up a fork, what do we? Yeah, what do we execute? We execute wait, and what does wait do? Remember what wait does? It if the number is positive, it subtracts one from it. Are you with me? And it just goes on; it doesn't wait. But and then if someone else does a wait after, when it is zero, what will happen? Will it subtract one and make it negative one? It'll get blocked. So I guess one means that the fork is available and zero means that's one fork is available on your that, that this means one this one this one fork is available. Okay. That's that's the intent. That's how we're going to use it. And now and now you guys, here is our here is our first attempt to solve this problem. And so and so it's loop forever. The philosopher thinks. Then what does he do? Wait what? Fork sub i. And now, so what will happen? That represents him doing what? Picking up the fork on his... Well, he doesn't necessarily have to wait if the value of SV is 1. So, you know, acquire, I mean, well, or, but, but it is wait, it is wait, but... But, but what does that represent him doing? The, this wait fork sub i represents him doing what? P picking up the fork on the left. And then wait sub fork i plus 1 represents him picking up the fork on the right. And by the way, we assume that this is mod, you know, 5. And then after he does that, 
he can eat, and while he is eating, if anyone else wants to wait on one of those forks, that person, that philosopher will be blocked. All right? And then after he gets through eating, what does he do? He does a signal, fork sub I. So what does that represent? Putting, putting down the fork on the table because, because if, it's, if it's zero, it, it, it adds one to it. So it makes it one again. And then uh, signal fork I puts on, puts the right one down. Now, does everybody see? Doesn't that make sense? And don't you see that we have mutual exclusion? Do we, so do, so what, what's our, what is our conclusion? Do we have mutual exclusion? Hmm? You don't think we have mutual exclusion? What if you got through one? Yes. And then the fork got picked up while he was waiting for the other one. Well, I mean, okay, you understand that the weights are atomic. So both weights have to execute at the same time. Oh no, 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 no. No, no. You can have interleaving. Oh, that was a good that was a good point. Yeah. So your point is what happens if there's interleaving between P two and P three? Yeah. Yeah? So what's the so but so what could happen in that case? I mean So like if he picked up the fork on his left. He picks up his fork on the left. Oh, no. Oh, now, did you just convince yourself that we do have mutual exclusion? I think so, yeah. This is, this is not, you know, this is not, I mean, you got to think this stuff through to see those. That's, I, that's a good thinking. That's a good way. That I like your thinking. This is the way you have to analyze this stuff. Okay, actually, we can prove that we have mutual exclusion. Now, watch this. This is really slick. By code inspection and mathematical induction, the number of philosophers holding fork I is, how many philosophers are holding fork I? Because how can you, because how can you, can you, how can you, how can you have fork I? You have to do a what? You have to execute wait fork I before you can eat, right? So by code inspection and mathematical deduction, the number of, of philosophers holding fork I is, the number of times wait fork I, fork I has executed minus the what? Signal fork I, because what do you do when you put it down? S signal, right? After you put it down. So, does that, so do you see by code inspection, the number of philosophers holding fork I is equal to the number, the number of times wait fork I has executed minus the number of times signal fork I has executed. But now look, you guys, remember that theorem 6.1? That worked in general? What did it say? It says weight, number weight, minus number signal is what? 1 minus SV. So therefore, the number of philosophers that are holding fork I is what? 1 minus what? S dot V. Are you with me? But what did it also say? S dot V is what? Greater than or equal to 0. Well, if you take 1 minus a number that's greater than or equal to 0, what do you get? A number that's what? Less than or equal to 1. Boom! Is that slick? You see how, is everybody with me on this? And, and in fact, you had determined, I think, that, that in your mind that, you, that we have mutual exclusion. Well, why do you think this is called the first attempt? <laughs> Do you, Zinni, let's go back and see. Let's go back and look at. Let's go back and look at this code. What What do you think? No, 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 no. We're saying that. We're saying that. Um, no to, no, no, we're, n yes. What we're saying is that no adjacent philosophers are e are using the same fork. No, no, definitely, this, we definitely did not prove that only, I mean, that would not, if, that would be a severe restriction if we only, if we only allowed one philosopher to eat at the same time. Yeah. That would be a pretty severe, so we want, we want as many to be able to eat as possible. Okay. But for not, but it's impossible for them to pick up the same fork. 
So yeah, that was a good point. So does everybody see? Yeah. At what point in time does that proof apply? Because I feel like it's an invariant. The question is, at what point in time did that proof apply? And my point is, is that it's an invariant. Because you could have a situation where one um, process has wet call weight and has grabbed that fork. Yes. And then it hasn't signaled it yet, so it's still eating, or maybe it's waiting for it. Yes. Fork on its right. Yes. And then the other process is waiting for that fork as well, so you have two weights and no signal. Okay, now, that is a really good point. And do you remember, in fact, I think we're going to scroll all the way back to this. Because we did do this kind of quickly. Let's go all the way back to, let's go all the way back to, to this slide. Complete execution of weight S. Now that's, the, because this is where, this is why we, we, we did this in early, is because this always comes up. How to interpret the number weight number signal executed. When weight S causes a process to block, the weight statement has not been completely executed. The weight S statement completes its execution when it is unblocked. And the example that we used was this uh, complete execution of weight S. So what happens is, over here in the bottom, do, do you remember this? This was, a, this was a state transition diagram of an algorithm that we were looking at. Um, and when P, so if we're in state P1, Q2, and P executes, then if you look at the code, you have to look at, the, at what the code was. Um, then what happens is it's executing a weight statement. So, then, so it's P2 prime. It executes a weight when the semaphore is zero. So it's P2 prime, and P, P gets put in, in this queue. Now, at this point, the weight statement has not completed executing, executing yet. Therefore, you don't count it. Okay. The, the number, the number. Right, so let's go back. All right, so let's go to the code here. Okay, but still there's a problem. Because otherwise we wouldn't have said, we wouldn't have said first attempt. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Oh wait, say that again. If 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 which one has picked up like one fork, then we one which which one which fork? <coughs> if each person picked up the fork on the left. Now how do you now, now what, what do you mean if each person picked up the fork on his left? In 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 what give me a, a scenario for it, during which that could happen. If it interleaves after statement two to each philosopher and then each philosopher picked up the fork, then it would get It would be stuck. Yeah, you nailed it. Did everybody hear that discuss that description? So what is what she said is that let's go, if we go to the picture here, you know, if this philosopher picks up his fork on the left and then is interrupted, bef we get interleaving. So that philosopher one picks up the fork on his left, and philosopher two picks up the fork on her left, and philosopher three picks up the philosopher on her left, and four on his left. And then, and then what happens? You, you like my political correctness there? <laughs> then what happens? You have a table of five philosophers, each with a fork, fork. spaghetti in front of them, and thinking about what they should do. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they've picked up their fork. And by our algorithm, they are, they, everyone is waiting. And so that's a deadlock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, the very smart. Well, whoever wrote the algorithm, I mean, that's why. So here it is. So, so here's algorithm 6.10. Deadlock free? No. And here's your scenario. P0 picks up fork 0 on his left. Pick P1 picks up fork 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4. And now no philosopher can pick up his fork on the right. I said her, but my slide also says, I'm going to have to go back and change that slide. I'll, I promise I'll do that. Uh, that's fun. All right, now, so you guys, any ideas? It didn't work. What are we going to do? Think, think about it. Think, think, about, think about how to, re so that algorithm is incorrect. We, gotta, we, we can't have, have possibility of deadlock. But how do we program that? 
what do you mean? Can't, well, he's had, he has to be able to eventually pick up the fork on his left to uh, eat, right? So, I mean, you can't forbid a philosopher from never picking up one of his forks, or that philosopher could never eat. But any 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 idea? How can how can we how can we write the solution? How can we how can we construct a solution that solves the dining philosopher's problem? Oh, that's a good that's that actually is 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 a way to do it. Did you hear what he said? Have it, but then the question is, how do you? He said, make the atomic operation be picking up both forks. Have that one be atomic. How would you do that with the semaphores? Actually, that's 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 a that's a good that's a great idea. We might we might come back and visit that. But can you think of how you would do that with a semaphore? With 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 semaphores, I mean. You could have a third semaphore pick up four semaphores. So you have to get. Oh, you would have a third. Uh, well, I guess that wouldn't guarantee that you have both your forks, but you have to get through that semaphore to be able to pick up either fork. And so. So you would have a semaphore for the. So if there pick, are, if well, there are five philosophers and six forks, then only three of them. Then there's only. But, 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 but wait, you say if there's five forks, but there's only five forks. Are there, well, there's one, two, is there five forks? No, there's five forks. Okay. Are you, are you with me? There's five, I mean, because they're, they're, they're on a circular table. Then you have, then the, you only have two resources in the pick up in the third, in the outer semaphore, and then only two people could grab that. So you're saying, so you're saying have a, have a, a, have a, 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 a semaphore at the pair of forks level. Yes. That you have to be able, but then how does that? How do you wait? Oh, I think I see what you're saying. I think what you're saying is, but I don't, I'm not sure that would work though, because here's a philosopher, philosopher, huh? Because if you if you have a semaphore that controls these two forks, what's and the, and this semaphore controls these two forks. How, how do you do that? I, 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 I kind of, yeah, I, I, I don't think that would, that was a nice, that was a nice way to think, but any, come on you guys, we gotta, we gotta solve this problem. We get, how are we gonna solve, there's actually several clever solutions. Just test it to one, two forks over, I think. Two forks over? Ah, uh, no, come on, uh, you guys need to think harder. Oh, I know you hate that phrase. Think, think outside the box. Think, how? What was? What was the? Oh, look. What was the scenario? What, what was the scenario that caused the deadlock? Everyone picks up the left fork. Every, well, everyone picked up the left fork. Pick up the left fork. Pick up the left fork. Pick up, and then everyone wanted to do what? Pick up the right, up the right fork. Okay, come on, think. Well, but the philosophers are the ones who are concurrently eating and thinking. So the philosophers need to be the processes. You see what I mean? Because they're the ones that we code through. We go in a loop and we code this is the, and, and then, and the, because the code executes like sequentially in the same way that the philosophers sequentially eat and pick up forks and think, uh, sorry, think, pick up forks, eat, put down forks. Think. So we need to be able to have that code run. So philosophers have to be the processes. Well, you guys are need to think outside. Well, no, you need to think outside the box. Come on, anyone out there <laughs> in the future? <laughs> Somebody from the future, come back and and tell us. What about this? Algorithm six point eleven solves the deadlock problem by simulating a room. So now, instead of instead of being sitting at a table, instead of sitting at a table, and all five of them and eating, they have to they think outside the room. You with me? And we solve the deadlock problem by simulating a room with a room semaphore that only allows what four, because we know that we can't have all five eating at the same time. If we have all five eating at the same time. 
there's the possibility of that. So we just don't let five of them meet at the same time. But that's not as conducive to discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you can't eat with the other just eating. I'm sure they like to talk about their thoughts as well. Yeah, well, what good does it do to have thoughts if you don't communicate them? Yeah. In fact, if you don't communicate the thought, do you really have the thought? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> if it's not communicated, is it there? Other people might not. I mean, you know, if the tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound? And no one's there, does it make it hear it? Does it make a sound? I don't know. But does everybody agree that this, will, this actually is one way to solve the problem? Okay? Yeah. You can simulate... Uh, a room and then they have to enter the room and you have a semaphore for the room that only lets four people in at a time. Because if there's only four people at a time in the room, you, you know that that scenario can't happen. You see, there will always be a fork available. Now, in order to be starvation free, yuck, yuck, get it? Get it? In order to be starvation free, yuck, yuck. <laughs> The room semaphore must be strong, but the fork semaphores can be weak. That's an interesting little factoid. What was a strong semaphore? One where the scheduling is what? FIFO, first in, first out. Okay. Now, so here's, here is the dining philosopher's second attempt. And now we have a semaphore array, 0 0.4, 4, 4, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And now we have another semaphore, room. And what's it initialized to? Four. And so what does that four represent? There are four seats at the table available. Right? And then what do you do? You think outside the room, and then what do you do? Wait room. Well, the first one who does wait room, that's four. What happens to, uh, to the room.sv? It becomes, it gets three, he goes in, another one goes in, it gets two, so now they're two eating at the same time. And then once they eat, and then once they're in the room, they wait fork sabai, wait fork sabai plus one, eat signal fork sabai, signal fork sabai plus, and then signal room to get out. And so boom, 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 they think outside the room. <laughs> yeah, you could. And this, by the way, is your assignment for Monday. Do this in Java. All right? I think that's what you're... I believe that is. Did you, did you, did you check that? You, yeah, I saw it. Did I, did I mention 6.11 as the one that you were supposed yeah, to do? Yeah, it says implement the Demi Philosopher solution of 6.11. 6.11 in Java. Yeah. So now you, you know. So now you've done job. You've done semaphores, and now you know that if you just run it, it's not interesting because uh, you have to put those random delays. So I have a specification in the problem for you to introduce random delays everywhere. Right? Try to make it, you know, fail. Okay. But there's another one. This this is kind of complicated. There's another one. Can you think of another one without do, using the room? And I'll give you a hint. Is all you, what you, I think the reason this was hard to come up with this next solution is because we think that every philosopher has to be programmed the exact same way. But what if you're free to program maybe just one philosopher different from the, rather, the other philosopher? <coughs> well, but how, but how do you have a semaphore for waiting for everybody to finish eating? Now, did you have an idea? Yes, because what happened was if they all picked up the left fork first, that's when the deadlock happened. So you just program one of the individuals to pick up the right fork first. And then the deadlock, isn't that interesting? Yeah, that, that was good, okay? So um, that's algorithm 6.12. Solves the deadlock problem by having the fourth fall off <laughs> Say fourth philosopher four times fast. <laughs> Having the fourth philosopher pick up his right fork first and then his left fork. If he blocks on picking up his right fork, his left fork will be available for philosopher three. Now that's an asymmetric solution. So some people think, oh, well, you, you know. It's... Yeah, why does one person have to be right-handed and left-handed when everyone else is right-handed or whatever? Yeah. 
So one philosopher acts differently from the others. And, and so this, so, so here's what you would do. You would, philosopher number four would do wait for fork sub zero and then wait, oh, it would be convenient to do this for the fourth philosopher too, by the way, wouldn't it? Because then you wouldn't have to do mod, you know? So he waits for the fork. Now, is, is this numbering correct? I mean, left and right? I uh, fork sub I was on the left. So yeah, so in, in different orders, right? Okay, is everybody, are we good? Okay. That's the famous dining philosophers and that's how you can solve it in semaphores and we had some great examples and scenarios about what can go right and what can go wrong. And that finishes semaphores. All right. Dun dun dun. All right. And so what's coming up next is and this is our last concept, our last chapter uh, for concurrency and for programming paradigms. Um, and there's, so there's one more, one more um, approach. Oh, I need to give you back your homeworks. Remind me at the end of class. Um, so there's one more approach to solving, to solving this problem, and that is monitors. These are called monitors. And uh, a monitor is, what we're doing here is we started at a very low level of abstraction with spin locks, then we abstracted this up with this tool for semaphores, and now we're gonna abstract it up kind of like one more level, monitors. This is a really, this is a great book. I really like the way he presents these in increasing abstract uh, at levels of abstraction. So, why would we want to do something differently when we've got semaphores that already work? There must be some dis disadvantage to using semaphores. Um, and d here's what it is. Um, when you use a semaphore, what has to happen is, or the way your code works, and it's kinda, it'd be kind of hard for you to sort of like see this with these little short programs that we're writing. But you know, in a production environment, you know, or in a commercial environment where you're producing commercial software, and the program that you're writing is really, really big, and you've got big pieces of code and lots of different files, and, and everything has to be coordinated. In order, in order to use semaphores correctly, they have to be scattered in all different parts of the code. Do you see what I mean? In other words, you could, it, suppose you have this project that has like, you know, I, I don't know, maybe like a dozen files or dozens of files. And each one of those files, you know, encapsulates some task of the whole system. And yet there is some sort of concurrency that you, I mean, and, you, and these things are all, you have processes that are threads that are running all over the place. You have dozens of threads that are running all over the place. And these things have to communicate with each other using this, the shared, ver you know, using this shared data structure. And you've got to have these signals and weights all, you know, in the code. Oh, I'm going to signal here, and then I'm going to wait over here, and this guy does this. There, and, and in order to analyze the whole thing, you, gotta, you, you have to kind of like know where every signal and weight is, is in all these different files in order to be able to debug it. You see what the scenario is? I mean, you see how that, in a, in a, in a big system, that's what could happen. All right? So the purpose of a monitor is don't let the user do something as low level as signal and weight. Instead, what you do is, and furthermore, what are, they, what are, they, what are these guys signaling, signaling and waiting to do? They've got some code in there that they don't want to have interleaved. So what you do is you take all that code that's going to be interleaved, that, that, uh, that you want to prevent from being interleaved, and you consolidate it into the monitor. Do you see what I mean? So that, 
so that the main program doesn't can't have critical sections spread all over the place. You consolidate the critical section in the monitor and then you guarantee atomic operations in order to access that data. So it's a, it's a consolidation thing. Instead of having semaphores and critical sections spread throughout the code of different processes, you put the critical sections into methods of the monitor class. Now what is a class? Class. <laughs> it, has, it has what? Um, methods and, uh, Method, yeah, methods and variables. The variables are called attributes in yeah. UML terminology. It has attributes and, methods. and methods. All right. And so, and so, and and that, in fact, is what a monitor is. Okay. So now. Um, so now, what, by way of illustration, what we're going to do is, now remember we did this program where we did, uh, we, we incremented n, n gets n, you know, temp, what was it? Temp gets n, n gets temp plus one. Okay, that, that kind of thing. Okay, so here, um, so now, and before what would happen was n was a global variable. It was just hanging out there by, you know, they all had access to it. But now what happens is the n that we're going to increment is not just a global variable that everyone has access to all over the place. Instead, it's, it's an attribute of the monitor. And people don't have access to it directly. They only have access to it through the monitor methods. Are you with me? Okay. And the way this solves the critical section problem is that the monitor methods are guaranteed to execute atomically. So that has to be provided by the monitor. Okay, and so here it is. Here is algorithm 7.1. All right, and look <laughs> what happens. This is amazing what we do. Remember we said we're gonna loop so many times and then, and then uh, just and add, you know, temp gets in, n gets 10 plus one. But what, what, and and that's, that was our critical section. But what we do is we make Integer temp, temp gets in, n gets temp plus one. We make that into a what? A method of the monitor. Do you see what I mean? So the main program isn't doing that. We make it a method of the monitor. And furthermore, this is guaranteed to execute atomically. And so here's, and so, and so now integer n is not a global variable, it's a what? It's an attribute of the monitor class. Does everybody see how that works? And then is all you have to do is, you just do, CS is the name of the monitor. Okay, CS is a, I think this means critical section. Okay, this is the, uh, and furthermore, when you do CS increment, when P does CS dot increment, that does all of this atomically. And then when Q does CS increment, that does all of that atomically. So there it is, in the same way that semaphores, the critical section problem was trivial with semaphores, it's also trivial with monitors. Are you with me on that? You see how that how that works? And that I, the, and the 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 fact that those that that every that the statement in increment executes without interleaving that's guaranteed by the monitor. Well, heck, if that's guaranteed, then you just let them increment, let him increment, let him, and none, no interleaving will ever take place because that's atomic. This has to go to completion before this one can go. Are you with me? Everybody, Let's see and note and because what did we have before? Where were the where were the signals and the weights before? Where were the signals and the weights before? They were yeah they were here in the in the processes code, so now they're not there anymore. Now we're going to study. There's a lot of there's a lot of subtle. Uh, characteristics of when you when you look at at how monitors are implemented and we're going to go into a, a more detail than what our book goes into um, we're going to take a look at a paper by Boer that uh, analyzes monitors but this figure executing a monitor operation is um, is a figure that I th I'm pretty sure that our author got this from th this paper that I just referred to by Boer um, but um, and it represents the fact 
uh, it, it's supposed to represent pictorially executing a monitor operation. So what happens is whenever you, this, th these represent processes that are waiting to get into the monitor and this represents a process that's in the monitor executing that code of the monitor. Because, because what happens is when, when one process is, is executing that uh, increment, what was the name of that one? Uh, cs.increment. When he's executing cs.increment, no one else can be executing cs.increment at the same time. So if they try to do their, inter you know, if those other ones, if he's in there and he's doing it and concurrently, while that one's in there, another one is trying to execute his cs.increment, they will be blocked. They will be blocked in the entry point of the queue. S sorry, they will, be they will be blocked in the queue at the entry point of the monitor. Is everybody with me on that? And this pictorially is how that is how our author represents that. Okay, now, um, so that was just a brief overview of what monitors are. Uh, next time, uh, which is I guess Monday, we will pursue this further and see how monitors actually work with with uh, entities that are in them called condition variables, and we'll see then that. That, that monitors have a very flexible and uh, it's re really a desirable feature to have. If you have monitors in your system, they're really, they're really good to use it's because they're at a higher level of abstraction and they have this uh, advantage of consolidating everything into one, uh, into one class. Okay, good deal. See you next time.